Hello once again and welcome to uh, the third lesson in the Logical English uh, series of lessons. A quick reminder, if you haven't already seen lessons one and two, please go to logicalenglish.com and, uh, and watch those lessons along with their study guides. Uh, speaking of study guides, if you don't already have one for this lesson, once again, please head to logicalenglish.com and download your study guide. You'll find it extremely, extremely useful, almost essential, I would say, for understanding and uh, uh, getting the most from this lesson. Um, this lesson, by the way, uh, it's going to be a little bit different in, from the others in as much as the others contain an awful lot of uh, information that I would say, you know, came purely from my own head. Um, this lesson, uh, it's more a restruct. I mean, there are a couple of gems that, uh, that are of my own uh, mind's production. Um, but it's more a restructuring of, uh, of, of what information that is already out there. Um, but the way I'm going to be presenting it, uh, we're going to be showing it step by step as the levels go along. Now, one of the problems with relative clauses, uh, which is what we're studying today, is that they're, they're really shown. Everything you can do with relative clauses is really, really shown all together. In fact, I've never seen it shown all together. So we're going to be presenting it step by step uh, together with all of the uh, levels uh, indicated. Um, once again, we're going to be starting simply, uh, but uh, yeah, this one really does get very complicated uh, reasonably quickly. So let's kick things off. OK, so th the first thing we're going to do uh, is I'm, I'm going to give you a couple of sentences here. My father is called David. My father is 77 years old. And just like you can see in the study guide, although uh, although I think <laughs> I think some of the numbers have changed. Yeah, that's how long I've been doing these lectures. Um, uh, what I'd like you to do is combine these two sentences to make one sentence. All right. At this point, you know, pause things. Uh, take a moment to uh, to give your answer. Now, I'm going to be, uh, as I say, I've, I've been teaching these uh, lessons for, for many years, and this one I, I'm going to treat slightly differently. I'm going to imagine, at least to begin with, that, uh, that I'm teaching this in front of a class full of students. And um, so I know what, uh, what you know, a, a typical intermediate, upper intermediate class's answers will be. And... I'm going to presume that uh, your answer was something along the lines of one of these. I'll read them out with you as we go through them. My father is called David and he is 77 years old. B. My father is called David who is 77 years old. C. My father, that is 77 years old, is called David. D. My father who is called David is 77 years old. E. My father, who is called David, is 77 years old. F. My father, David, is 77 years old. And G. My father, who is called David, is 77 years old. Now, I'm going to presume that you gave me, you wrote down something like one of those answers. And, and I know they all look incredibly similar. And I suppose, well, hey, that's the purpose of this lesson, to find out which one's right, which ones are wrong, um, and if they're wrong, why are they wrong? And conversely, uh, well, if I tell you that only one of these is actually completely correct, we'll also go on to find out pretty quickly why it's correct. So right now, I want you to think, even if your answer is even a little bit wrong, and in fact, the, the correct one here, uh, maybe you got it, maybe you didn't, is the very last one, G. G is completely correct. The others, much as they might look completely correct, are actually wrong. And even if your answer is even a little bit wrong, well, this lesson's all about uh, Cambridge exams and IELTS exams and, and impressing the examiners and proving what level you are. And if your answer is even a little bit wrong, you're going to be losing marks, uh, valuable marks, uh, in those exams. So let's go on and find out uh, and start our journey and find out why they're right, why they're wrong. 
So let's start with the very basics then of, uh, of the subject of relative clauses. Um, and we'll return to our, our sentence that, uh, that we saw was the, the correct one. And we'll start now to, to build our knowledge and understand why it's, uh, it's correct. Um, we've got my father, comma, who is called David, comma, is 77 years old. Equally, uh, no problem at all. We could say my father, comma, who is 77 years old, comma, is called David. I've got a couple of questions for you now. In each of those sentences, what is the main clause and, uh, and what is the relative clause? Now, when, don't forget, when we're talking about the main clause, we're saying, which is the part of the sentence that we just, if we remove it, the sentence wouldn't make sense? Which is the part of the sentence which has to be there? So let's, we'll just focus on the first of these. My father, who is called David, is 77 years old. The main clause is, my father is 77 years old. And that bit in the middle, that comma, who is called David, comma, we know that as the relative clause. By the way, I'll be referring to relative clauses as RCs, just because it will save space and it will save time. Uh, you'll have to trust me on that one. So we, now, we know which, uh, which is the main clause and which is the relative clause. We know that we, we can't remove the main clause. But in these sentences, can we remove the relative clause? I mean, if I just say my father is 77 years old, it's, uh, it's fine, isn't it? There's no problem at all. So in this kind of relative clause, we can remove the relative clause. And we'll, we'll see what that's called uh, uh, and how we can do that in just a moment. Um, but first, another quick question for you. I, you, he, she, etc. They're all known as, uh, as what? Well, you know as well as I do, they're all known as pronouns. These, these words, these short words, which sort of represent something else, are called pronouns. So if they're called pronouns, in our sentences, who represent, what does who represent in our sentences? In our sentences, who represents my father. And so this who and in, in, in all of our uh, relative clauses, in all of our RCs, we call this a relative pronoun. This short word that represents something else, we'll, we're going to call it a relative pronoun. And just at this point, can you, uh, can you think of any other uh, relative pronouns in English? And we're going to be keeping a tally of them along the side as we go through the lectures. But uh, what have we got? We've got, uh, well, we've already seen who. That's in this, that's in these sentences. So we've got who. I'm sure you're also saying which. Some of you, uh, some of you are saying, suggesting that. Uh, what else might we have? Uh, oh, yeah. Okay, someone's just suggested whom, of course. Uh, then there's when. Where? Oh, and of course, why? And someone's just shouted out, what? Well, no. What is not a relative pronoun? And I'll, uh, I'll come on to, as we go through this lesson, we're going to be discussing all of these relative pronouns uh, as we go along. So, it's round about at this point that I say um, welcome to level three to four. Uh, and here I have to give a word of caution. If you consider yourself an intermediate student, intermediate or above, and you're having problems with this so far, then you might need to study, uh, to restudy relative clauses or to spend a little bit more time on it because we're moving up in the levels here. And, and if you're hoping to get a, a good FCE or, or, or CAE or, or IELTS score, here, what we're doing right now, right here at levels three to four, it's, it's really not going to, uh, to impress the examiners that much. But let's have a look at what we've learned so far. 
Here's our sentence again. My father, comma, who is called David, comma, is 77 years old. So the first thing you need to remember is that relative clauses must be placed immediately after the thing that they're describing. So it's not my father is 77 years old, comma, who is called David, but because we're describing my father, it comes immediately after my father. My father, comma, who is called David, comma, is 77 years old. In our sentence, can we remove the relative clause? Well, we discussed that earlier and, and we decided that, yeah, in this sentence, yes, we can. So in our sentence, yes, we can remove the relative clause. Therefore, this kind of relative clause is called a non-defining relative clause. We're going to be knowing that as non-def RC. So because we can remove it, remove the relative clause, we can call it a non-defining relative clause. And something that is absolutely critical to remember is non-defining relative clauses have commas separating them from the main clause. So we have my father, comma, who is called David, comma, is 77 years old. So as I say, when it comes to those rules and these non-defining relative clauses, Welcome to level three to four. Oh, by the way, th this level system that I'm imagining is is kind of loosely based on IELTS, kind of loosely based on the Canadian system, kind of loosely based. It's we're imagining ten levels, and so intermediate, you know, where you're aiming for uh, to begin with anyway, would be five to six. So this represents really below what we would consider your level. So as I say, welcome to level three to four. Okay, we're going to uh, we're going to continue our discussion of the absolute basics of relative clauses right now, and uh, I want you to imagine a situation. I want you to imagine I'm walking along the street, and I see uh, a good friend of mine uh, coming the other way, and I and I want to tell him something. We, it's the first time we've met today, uh, so and I want to tell him something uh, something that happened to me, and I say to him. Uh, the person was, uh, hey Mike, uh, the person was very interesting. And then I walk off. Well, the question, what's wrong with this sentence? I mean, the person, subject, uh, was, verb, very interesting. We've got uh, adverb and adjective on the other side. It's grammatically okay. But what's wrong with it? Hey Mike, the person was very interesting. Well, Hopefully the, the, the answer is jumping out at you that um, it, it's missing some, offense, some essential information that allows us to know which person we're talking about. If I just say the person was very interesting, well, Mike's left, my friend Mike's left thinking, but Craig, what, what, what person are you talking about? So this is where we need something like this. The person who I met last night was very interesting. So we've got the main clause, the person was very interesting, and in between we've got the relative, another relative clause, uh, who I met last night. Becoming the person who I met last night was very interesting, and now Mike knows which person I'm talking about. But do you notice that there are no commas in this sentence? Hopefully you do. And so here we have our sentence, uh, the person who I met last night was very interesting. And it's at this point that I say, um, hey, welcome to level four to five. And I would argue still not quite at the level that, uh, uh, that we need you to be at. Um, but as I say, this is still the basics. And because, uh, let's look at the first rule here, because the uh, relative clause is essential to understand what we're talking about, we call this...
a defining relative clause. We call the previous ones non-defining relative clauses because, well, hey, they didn't define what they were talking about. They weren't essential, or they are not essential. And um, because this one defines it, because this one is essential, we call it a defining relative clause. Nice and logical, right? And something that is absolutely critical, but often underappreciated, absolutely critical to remember, is defining relative clauses do not use commas. Non-defining relative clauses are separated by commas from the main clause. Defining relative clauses do not use commas. So let's now return to our original example sentences and, uh, and, and see if we can start to explain why they're right, why they're wrong. So now back at our example sentences uh, that we saw uh, right at the beginning of this uh, this lesson, um, let's uh, let's go through them and, and and see if we can decide together why what you thought at the time maybe was a correct answer is not a correct answer, and why the one that is correct is correct. So a, my father is called David and he is seventy seven years old. Well, to be honest, actually, hey, there's there's nothing wrong with that sentence. The only problem being is that uh, this is an intermediate and uh, and upper intermediate, you know, and above uh, lesson. Um, I, you know, we we know how to use the word and. Uh, the The purpose of the of these le purposes of these lessons are not to teach you how to use and. We know that that is uh, below your level, and if you were to try and, uh, you know, putting that kind of thing into any kind of exam, well, it's not exactly going to impress the examiners. So, a although it's right, we're gonna we're gonna throw it away because, well, it's just below us. So we've got a cross there. Second one, my father is called David, who is 77 years old. Well, we've got the main clause, my father is called David, and we've got the relative clause, who is... Ah, but we've got it in the wrong position. One of the first things we learnt was that who is 77 years old, not only does it need a comma, because, hey, I've only got one father, we don't need to define my father, um, not only does it not have a comma, but it's also... The relative clause is also in the wrong position. It needs to come immediately after my father. So that one's wrong. See, my father, that is 77 years old, is called David. Well, we've got the commas, but we're using the word that. We're going to come on to that in a little, in a little moment. My father... Oh, sorry, my father, who is called David, is 77 years old. Well, here there are no commas, and so would be marked incorrectly. So that's wrong. My father, who is called David, is 77 years old. Well, OK, we've got the first comma, but we don't have the second comma separating it from the rest of the main clause. My father, David, is 77 years old. Well, the student here has tried to be quite quite smart and potentially uh, close uh, close to, the, to a correct answer. But we're still dealing with a non-defining relative clause. So we would still need commas either side of David, even though the student is trying to do something uh, quite high level, which we'll see in a little while. And that leaves us with G being the only correct one. We've got the non-defining relative clause placed in the correct position with commas either side of it. And on the subject of commas, uh, let's, uh, let's have a look at an interesting example which will show just how important these things are in, uh, within the subject of relative clauses. Okay, so just for a moment we're going to come on to the subject of, uh, of commas. And uh, I would argue absolutely critical commas. Now, uh, just briefly, last lesson in the when we talked about uh, the conditionals, uh, we saw the importance of commas, uh, at, at least in the examiner's eyes. Um, here, within the subject of relative clauses, is the only place in English where comma, commas, and comma knowledge is absolutely critical, 
uh, and it's the only place where commas can actually change the meaning of the sentence. I want to show you what I mean. And you've probably seen a sentence similar to this before in, in, in textbooks and exercise books. Two sentences. My brother, comma, who lives in Melbourne, comma, is an accountant. My brother who lives in Melbourne is an accountant. Well, they contain exactly the same words, but one contains commas, one doesn't. My question for you is, in each case, how many brothers do I have? I'll give you a, a brief moment to think about that one. And I hope you're coming to the, uh, to the conclusion that in sentence A, I only have one brother. In sentence B, I have more than one. Now, the reason for that is this. In sentence A, we're, we're using commas there. We're, we're using a, a, a non-defining relative clause. And if we're using a non-defining relative clause, well, then it means that the thing that we're describing, my brother, doesn't need any kind of uh, definition. The relative clause is not essential for the sentence. And if it's not essential for the sentence, then just like the sentence with my father, I mean, I only have one father. So in this sentence A, I only have one brother. However, in sentence B, here with no commas, we do feel the need to, or the speaker obviously feels the need to define the brother, to define which brother he's talking about. And if he feels the need to define which brother he's talking about, there's only one reason for that. It's because he's got more than one brother. So in B, it might be my brother who lives in Melbourne is an accountant, but my brother who lives in Darwin is, uh, is an architect. So we're defining the two different brothers using the relative clause. And in A, no definition necessary, it's a non-defining relative clause, so we've got commas. So this is the only case in the whole of the English language, these kind of relative clauses and the differences between defining and non-defining, it's the only time when commas can actually change the meaning of the sentence. The words are the same, but the punctuation is slightly different and the meaning actually change, changes. Now, what we've seen so far represents the absolute basics of relative clauses. Hopefully you're fully on board with them and, and you know what's going on and this rep just represents revision. Because if you're performing some kind of FCE or IELTS exam or any other kind of exam, if you get these basics correct, no one's going to give you a round of applause. You're not going to get any credit, really, for, for getting this stuff correct. However, if you get it wrong, you're going to notice your score go down quite sharply. So it is absolutely essential to get these basics completely correct before we move on. So now with those absolute basics uh, firmly in place, Let's move on to something ever so slightly more complicated, but still it shouldn't be too much of a challenge to, uh, to the vast majority of you. Um, once we've done that, we'll also start to look at uh, what this tells us about the English language and, and we'll, we'll deepen our general knowledge of the English language as well. So uh, what we're going to be discussing right now is replacing the RP, the relative pronoun, with that. Now let's get our list back up of uh, the relative pronouns. Uh, we had this list earlier, the relative pronouns being who, which, that, whom, when, where and why, not what, don't forget. Um, which two of these can be replaced with that? Well, I'm sure by now you're all screaming out the answers, you already know. Uh, it's who and which. So let's have a look at a, a brief example before we have a look at the reasons. Which of these sentences is not possible? We've got sentence A. My father, comma, that is 77 years old, comma, 
is called David. By the way, when I'm saying the commas, don't forget, you don't necessarily, you don't need to say the commas. I'm just saying them just to make it completely clear uh, that they're actually there. So A, my father, comma, that is 77 years old, comma, is called David. Sentence B, the woman that you introduced me to was very interesting. Now, what do we know about these sentences? Well, we can see that A is a, is a non-defining relative clause because we can see the commas and because, well, hey, like the majority, I'm not going to say all, but like the majority of people, I only have one father and so uh, I don't need to define him in any way. This is just extra information. So there we have the non-defining relative clause. However, uh, the relative clause in B that you introduced me to uh, we've got a defining relative clause, otherwise we have no idea which woman we're talking about, and aside from that, we can't see any commas there anyway. So which one of these is not possible? Well, in fact, sentence A is not possible. Sentence B is. Let's move along and have a look at uh, the reason uh, behind that. So, at this point, when it comes to uh, replacing who and which with that, I'm going to say, welcome to level five. Uh, we're about halfway there. Now, with this grammar, if you if you get it right in the exam, the uh, the examiner is likely to think, uh, or in like in an IELTS or an FC Cambridge exam, the examiner is likely to think to start thinking. Okay, this student, uh, this student, I believe, belong, deserves to be taking this exam. Let, let's see how well they do. And so the rule that we've just seen is who and which can only be replaced with that in a defining relative clause. So that there deals with uh, uh, the third on our list of relative pronouns. As I'll repeat it again, who and which can only be replaced with that in a defining relative clause. Now, so far, so good. I'd been, uh, I had been teaching this for years, um, perfectly happily, uh, no questions asked, until a particularly good student, a particularly switched on student, asked me, uh, and I've touched on this before in previous, le in previous lessons, asked me the best question you, as a student, can ever ask in class. And I might add, it's one which teachers often live in absolute fear of. The question, of course, was why? What, you know, what's the purpose of this? Why, why can you only replace a who and which with that in defining relative clauses, not non-defining relative clauses? Who, you know, why, why should I bother to use this? Well, that sent me away thinking, and uh, it took me a little while to come up with the answer, but I believe I have come up with the answer, and, and an answer which makes logical sense for, for your usage of it in, in English. Um, I'll give you a clue. Relative clauses, RCs, that use that as their relative pronoun, RPs, are likely to be spoken or quite informal. So if you use that in your defining relative clause, it's probably going to be spoken or quite informal. Any ideas? Let's move on now and, uh, and, and look at the answer that, that, uh, that I came up with. Now, in just a moment, I'll come on to explain uh, the, the answer that I came up with. But before I do that, I'll explain why I'm such a big fan of answers like these. Because as a teacher, uh, it is so incredibly emo uh, motivational uh, to be able to provide your students with reasons, like why reasons, not just telling them what to do, but telling them how to do it as well. Um, you know, it's the linguistic equivalent of giving a man a fish as opposed to uh, teaching him how to fish. Uh, the understanding the logic and the whys behind the language is, is absolutely critical at an intermediate and a higher level. So let's have a look at uh, the answer 
that I came up with and I firmly believe is correct. Let's look at the way we say them. Now, in a, in a non-defining relative clause, the one we've been looking at all the way through, we would say, my father, and then we would drop our voice, drop the pitch of our voice. My father, who is 77 years old, and then we'd come back up again, is called David. So it becomes, my father, who is 77 years old, is called David. And so we're changing our intonation here. We're changing the pitch of our voice to say the relative clause, to make it clear that it's a non-defining relative clause. With a defining relative clause, however, I'll read it out for you. The woman who you introduced me to was very interesting. Nothing really happens with our voice when we're, when we're moving from the main clause to the defining relative clause. It stays at the same pitch. The intonation stays at the same strength. To, to turn this into a graph just for a moment. So non-defining relative clauses go ba -da -da, ba -da -da -da, ba -da -da, something like that. Whereas defining relative clauses, just ba -da 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 -da. they don't change their intonation. Now, let me just speak about this for a moment because now we come on to the why. English is an incredibly musical language and um, most nat uh, native speakers can control their voice enough to supply this music that we've just seen between, you know, non-defining relative clauses where you drop your pitch and then come back up again. They can supply this music and pitch control um, and, you know, we also refer to this as intonation. But then now a question for you guys. I'm sure you'll be able to uh, uh, sympathise with it. Have you ever been at a party speaking to an incredibly boring person? You know, um, someone with, a, with, a, with quite a flat, monotonous voice. Uh, quite a boring voice, really. Um, and, and so you're stuck talking to them and you're looking at your friend and you're saying, Help, get me out of here. Just because that person has quite a boring voice that doesn't really change the pitch of it at all. The, the intonation doesn't really change at all. And you just want to get out of there. So in order to make it clear to the listener, because, you know, in writing we have commas. And you don't, you know, you can't convey intonation other than those commas. Um, but in speaking... Uh, how do you make it clear that the information that you're giving in your relative clause is essential? That we're using a defining relative clause and, and well, we're going to use that to make the listener wake up. It's like a, when you use that when you're speaking uh, and you're, when you're using relative clauses, you're using a defining relative clause and you use the word that as the relative pronoun. It's like a slap in the face to the, to the listener. It's like saying, hey, wake up. You need this piece of information. In order to understand what I'm telling you, you need this piece of information. However, if we're speaking using a, uh, def a defining relative clause and we use, or, and we use a non-defining relative clause and we use who or which, well, we're, what we're basically saying to the to the listener is that okay, you can have a you can have a little micro sleep now for half a second. You can just pay attention to something else because the information I'm giving you is not really essential. So that is the critical difference between using that and not using that. That would n normally be used uh, in speaking or in formal situations for defining relative clauses. What this means in an exam is if you're writing something like a, a, a formal essay, you don't want to use that at all. But if you're writing a letter to a friend, then you want to use that all the time, if you can, in your, uh, in your, in your writing. Because that's a relatively informal uh, piece of writing. Uh, in the speaking parts of the exams, uh, I suggest using, well, Try to use a mixture of them, which, who, and that. Make it, and uh, 
be sure to, to try and practice your intonation. Uh, a quick tip for practicing your intonation is trying to say, if you're saying a, a, a speaking a non-defining relative clause or a sentence with a non-defining relative clause in it, try to say it either really or imaginarily, try to say it to two different people. So, for example, I'll say, if I've got my friends Jack and John, I'll say, my father, to Jack, and then to John, I'll say, who is 77 years old, and then I'll come back to Jack, is called David. My father, who is 77 years old, is called David. So even aside from any kinds of exam situations, my, my encouragement here would be, try not to be that boring person in the party who's not changing their intonation at all. So there we go. With that said, let's move on. Okay, uh, onwards and upwards. Now, uh, a quick reminder. Do you remember back in uh, lessons one and two uh, how we, we spent actually quite a lot of time uh, looking at uh, what what's a subject, uh, what's an object, and uh, things that seem fairly simple. Maybe you were okay with them, maybe you weren't. But we're going to, you know, they're really coming back now into uh, relative clauses. So, as I say, onwards and upwards, and uh, let me give you the uh, the next stage of uh, relative clause development and uh, a new question. For, first of all, it comes under the heading of uh, reduced relative clauses. There's a couple of items in reduced relative clauses, and here we're talking about omitting or leaving out or not using the relative pronoun. So the question for you, from which of these sentences can I omit or leave out the relative pronoun? We've got sentence A, this is the woman who I met last night. We've got sentence B, this is the woman who spoke to me last night. Both of them are defining relative clauses. Both of them are using the relative pronoun who. So, hey, defining relative clause, using the word, the relative pronoun who, what can we change it to? Yeah, you're absolutely right. We can change who to that, if we were speaking or using it informally. And this represents a big welcome to level six and seven, really. This is when things start to get a little bit trickier and the examiner starts to get a little bit more impressed if you do it correctly. And the rule is this. Well, let's have a look at it for a moment. Well, the correct answer here is, of course, A. I can, if I want to, remove the uh, or omit the relative pronoun from uh, from the relative clause in sentence A. But let's start having a look at why. In uh, in both sentences, what's the main clause? This is the woman, right? This is the woman, this is the woman. Okay, and then we've got the relative clause, the defining relative clause on the other side. Who I met last night, who spoke to me last night. In the main clause, the subject is this, the verb is is, and the object is the woman. And in both cases, the defining relative clauses are describing the woman. Don't forget, they're coming immediately after the thing we're describing. So they're both describing the woman. But now let's turn our attention to the defining relative clause. In, this, in the relative clause in A, who is the subject? Here's a question, <laughs> not a statement. The question, who is the subject of the relative clause? Well, I, right? I met the woman. So I is the subject. In sentence B, who is the subject of the relative clause? Well, there's no I, there's no, in fact, who is the subject? The woman is the subject of the relative clause. So it's the same, right? The woman, and then there's no other subject being mentioned here at the beginning of the relative clause, whereas up here, the woman, who, or, or nothing. And then we've got another subject. So because the subject of the relative clause and the thing that it's describing is different, we can, if we want to, 
omit the relative pronoun. Let me get that rule on the board for you, on the screen rather. <laughs> Been a teacher for too long. Uh, the rule is the omission of an RP, of a relative pronoun, is only allowed in, well, first of all, it's only allowed in defining relative clauses and only when the thing you're describing and the subject of the relative clause are different. So if they're different and it's a defining relative clause, you can, if you wish, remove the relative pronoun. Let's move on to the, the next stage of uh, omissions from, uh, from relative clauses. So the next stage of uh, omitting or removing or leaving things out of uh, relative clauses, in other words, creating a reduced relative clause, is, um, well, let's have a look. Omitting the relative pronoun and more. Now, as always, I've got a question for you. Which two words can we omit from these two sentences? We've got sentence A. Can you see the child that is crossing the road? We've got sentence B. The capital of the UK, which is London, is a huge city. Yeah, so we've got sentence A, that's a defining relative clause, and we've used the word, we've used the relative pronoun that instead of who. Um, so defining relative, okay. And sentence B, we've got, uh, got non-defining relative clause because it's just extra information. It's not essential to understand the the sentence. Uh, so we're we're not we can't use that. We're just using which, and we've got the commas either side. So, but from both of those sentences, we can remove two words. Any ideas? Well, in fact, from both of them. We can remove the relative pronoun and the verb to be from the relative clause. Doesn't matter whether it's defining or non-defining. We can doesn't matter what the relative pronoun is, we can still remove the relative pronouns that, which, or who, and the verb to be from the relative clauses leaving sentence A coming up as, can you see the child crossing the road? And we've got sentence B as, the capital uh, of the UK, London, is a huge city. Both kinds of sentences I'm sure you've seen many, many times before, but now you can see what's actually happening there. So let's, let's have a look at the rules, shall we? And once again, we're, we're in levels six to seven here. So we're in the area where we're going to start where we're going to start really impressing those examiners. So the rule being this. If your relative clause uses the verb to be, you can omit the relative pronoun and the verb be in either a defining or a non-defining relative clause. So I hope that's nice and clear before we move on to uh, what really is the, the most advanced thing you can do uh, with relative clauses. Okay, uh, we're going to come on now to have a look at uh, something that really represents one of the most formal things you can do in the whole of the English language. Um, and hopefully you've noticed uh, on the left hand side we've got uh, we've got our list of relative pronouns and we've dealt with who, which and that. We're now going to start dealing with some of the others. But first I want you to do this relatively simple thing for me. We're on the subject of prepositions. Now uh, I don't know how many of you can re recall from lesson one how many prepositions are there out there? Yeah, unfortunately, there's about 126. Uh, you'll always have problems with them, but to be honest, uh, there are some that you should know pretty well. Uh, by prepositions, we're talking about um, in, on, under, at, through, between, against, etc., etc. I want you to do this for me. Which preposition, or prepositions, because some of them may have many answers, would you attach to the following verbs? Well, we've got look, 
talk, think, interested, rely, walk, read, and listen. Have a think about that for a moment. Okay, now I'm going to uh, I'm going to put a couple of answers up here. Maybe they'll they're your answers. Uh, maybe they're not. Maybe they, I mean there might be some others, um, but the the answers I would most readily give are well, for example, look. Well, you look at something, don't you? I suppose you could also uh, look into something, uh, look through something, um, look between something. But I think the one we would use most of the time is look at. What about talk? Well, you often talk to some someone. Talk to someone. You can talk about something. Um, yeah, I suppose those would be the most common. Think. Well, I'd probably think about something. Uh, you could think through something. You could think of someone. Um, if you want to give them your caring thoughts, I suppose. Um, but I would most readily use think about. Uh, interested, I think really that only has one preposition that can attach to it, and that would be interested in. Rely, let's always rely on. You rely on someone, or you can rely on something, meaning you depend on them. Notice how they're using the same preposition there. Walk could be many, you know, walk in the park, walk on the grass, um, walk through the tunnel, walk over the bridge, walk between the houses. It really could be many, many, many. Um, I'm going to say, I don't know, let's say uh, walk in. I'll take that was my first answer, walk in the park, but it could be many. Read, now there's a couple of different choices here. You can read to a child, for example. When you're when they're falling asleep, um, you can read about something in the newspaper. In fact, I think I'm going to use that one here because I think that might be the most common. Read about something in the newspaper. Um, I suppose you could read on the sofa. If you're lying on the couch, you can read the newspaper while you're lying on the sofa. Um, listen, listen would pretty much always be listen to. Listen to someone, listen to something. Now, here's what what you can do with relative clauses, and it will impress those, uh, those examiners. If we take our first sentence, or two sentences in fact, this is the subject, I am interested in it, Two sentences, no relative clauses there. Let's combine them in the way that we're, we're already very well accustomed to. Uh, we're going to create a defining relative clause. This is the subject which I am interested in. And because here I'm concerned about using formal language, I'm not going to change which to that. I'm going to keep it as a nice, formal, full, if you like, full relative pronoun, which. This is the subject which I am interested in. Well, here now... I'll show you what you can do in the language, which represents basically it would, the, the most formal thing we could do, and it's incredibly easy. If we've got here the relative clause, the defining relative clause, which I am interested in, and interested t taking the preposition in, if we just take that preposition, and send it to the front of the relative clause. So we have, this is the subject in which I am interested. This is a process called front-loading the preposition. Front-loading the preposition. I'll write that up on the next slide. Um, but it, it once you get the hang of it, and once you, this is normally for writing, and it's always formal. Once you get the hang of it, uh, it's incredibly easy to do as long as your sent, your relative clause uh, uses a preposition. All you need to do is pick up that preposition if you're writing a a, a formal uh, piece of writing. 
pick it, pick up the preposition, throw it in front of your relative pronoun in, in the relative clause, and you've got it. This is the subject in which I am interested. Uh, and, and this is guaranteed to impress an examiner. So let's have a look at another example. Okay, so uh, just to be clear, uh, we're calling this front-loading a preposition, where you're picking up the preposition from the end of the relative clause and throwing it in front of the relative pronoun, front-loading a preposition. And, and I said we'd have a look at uh, another example. Well, let's do that. We've got, this is the person I spoke to this person last night. Becomes, this is the person who I spoke to last night. We've got that defining relative clause and we're using who as the relative pronoun. So what does that become? And careful, because I might be trying to trick you a little bit. You've probably written something like, this is the person to who I spoke last night. In other words, you've, you've picked up that relative, you've picked up that preposition from the relative clause and front-loaded it in front of the relative pronoun, which in our case is the word who. But here I need to urge you to be extremely careful, something you need to remember. If, if your relative pronoun is who, and you're front-loading the, the preposition, then who must become whom. Simply no choice. And so now uh, if we have a look through our list of relative, pro relative pronouns, we've dealt with who, which, that. Now we've dealt with whom as well. We know what, we know what that's doing. Uh, to explain that in a little bit more grammatical depth, do you remember back in uh, lesson one, uh, I like you, therefore you like me, right? If if I is the subject, it's I, but if, if I is the object, it's me. Well, in the same kind of way, uh, that's what's happening here. If who is the subject, it's who. But if who is the object, it's whom. Now, that's almost completely dropped out of uh, English apart from in the most formal situations. And as I said, front-loading a preposition really is quite a formal thing to do. So at this point, welcome to levels seven to eight. Now, here, you, if you're getting, every, getting it all right and you, you, everything's working logically, then, um, hey, you're looking at some nice high scores. And what hopefully you're also doing and what I really want to impress upon you is that as you're going through your writing in any, whether it be for, for a teacher, for a um, project, for a business, for, uh, for, for an exam, for whatever, you have choices. You have choices in your relative clauses. You may well want to write it all out and then read it again and look for those relative clauses and change a couple of them. If you've got a defining relative clause, change uh, who for that. If you've got a, a relative clause with a, uh, where you're using the verb to be, omit the relative pronoun and the verb to be. If you're, um, if like this, you, you, you're using a, a verb in the relative clause where you've got a preposition, front load it. By providing all of these uh, uh, ver uh, varieties of relative clauses, you are really going to be able to impress your your recipient, the person, either whether it's an examiner or your boss or your teacher, whomever. You really will be able to impress them if you give a nice sprinkling of all these different uh, different things. Now we're going to come on to. Uh, a frustrating piece of grammar now that I would class as grammar theory for levels 9 to 10, but I have also seen it being tested in Cambridge exams, in, in FCE exams. So, although it, it is just 
it, it's one of those things that's so so rarely taught but you're often just expected to know it instinctively well i think it's time to teach it let's have a look so We've been doing a couple of different things as, as we've been going through this lesson. We've, uh, on one hand, been working our way up through the levels and getting more and more complicated and, uh, and tricky as we've been going along. Um, we've also been working our way through our relative pronouns list. Uh, and so far we've seen, um, we've seen who, uh, which, that, whom. Well, now we're also going to uh, cross when, where and why off the list. So the subject is when, where, and why, as relative pronouns. But there's something I need you to bear in mind. This represents some advanced grammatical theory. So, hey, uh, welcome to levels 9 to 10, you know, the really advanced stuff. However, I have seen this tested in the FCE Cambridge exam, an exam which specialises in levels 5 to 8. So, once again, I'll, I'll remind you that it's not really something that gets taught, but it is something you're expected to instinctively have picked up uh, by the upper intermediate level. So, and I don't like this allowing students to pick things up instinctively thing. I like to know that the students have a clear idea of what's happening. So let's have a look at an example of this. I'd like you to complete the following sentences. Sentences which are incredibly similar, but not quite the same. Sentence A, the hospital I was born in is in London. Sentence B, the hospital I was born is in London. Huh. How are they different? What's changed? Sentence B has one fewer words. Sentence A has seemingly an extra preposition. What do you think the answer might be there? In sentence A, the hospital I was born in is in London. We've got that relative clause. We need a relative pronoun here. I was born in. And then sentence B, we've just got the relative clause relative pronoun, I was born. So we're missing that word in. So when we've got the word in, we want to complete that with which, the hospital which I was born in is in London. However, in sentence B, we're going to use the word where. Now, what does that tell you then about what where as a relative pronoun means. Well, I hope you're getting the idea that where means which in, or if we're going to front load it, in which. In other words, where means preposition plus which. And in fact, that is also true for um, when and why. They all mean preposition plus which. Let me go on to prove this to you. So I'm going to try and prove to you uh, that when, where and why all mean uh, preposition plus which. Uh, and to do that I'm going to use some knowledge of some other languages. Uh, so there we've got when, where and why all meaning preposition plus which. But let's take another of these relative pronouns, the word why. And to understand this, let's look at the word why in Spanish, Portuguese and French. I'm sure there's a lot of you uh, of uh, speak a lot of you out there that speak those languages. Um, in those languages, how do you say how do you how do you how do you say not translate but how do you say the word why? Well, in Spanish and here you're going to have to forgive my my uh, pronunciation. <laughs> I'm sure it's way off, but let me try it anyway. Spanish uh, is por qué. Portuguese, por qué. And in French, por quoi. Now, if I ask you, especially Sp uh, speakers of those languages, what do they mean? You'll probably say, well, they mean why. 
But now I want to say, no, what do they actually, actually mean? When you really break them down, what do they really mean? And I hope you'll come to the conclusion that por que, por que, por qua, they all mean for which. You could also translate it as for what, but we're not going to use the word what here, but for which. So the word for why in those languages means the same as, uh, as kind of up here. We've got preposition plus which. For, which is a preposition, plus which. So in fact, it is working in exactly the same way. Something you really need to remember, however, when using uh, when, where, and why as relative pronouns in English is because it's a tr contraction of preposition plus which, it cannot be front-loaded because uh, when, where, and why already contain uh, a preposition, right? So you can't put another prep uh, an extra one before even that one. Therefore, when using when, where, and why as relative pronouns, it is relatively informal, or, or you know, let, be, let me be more accurate, certainly not formal English. Which is why I would argue that who and which and whom would be your formal relative pronouns, whether they're front-loaded or not. That would be spoken when, where, and why would all be, I'm not necessarily going to say spoken, but certainly informal in some kind of way. Now, all the way through, uh, through this lesson, um, I've been weaving in the idea of what level the different, uh, the, the different stages of relative clauses represents. Um, and I just want to touch on that a little bit more. Here's just a brief word about levels. Yes, in where to go from here, really. Uh, yes, levels 9 and 10 are filled with even more grammar and certainly a whole load of vocabulary. However, essentially, levels 9 and 10, the very top, it's all about being able to get all the previous grammar correct all of the time. Everything we've discussed in lessons one, two, and three, if you can put the rules into play, if you can understand the logic behind it, if you can see the systems that govern English and practice it, for goodness sake, uh, and get it right all the time, you're going to be uh, an impressive uh, advanced level student. Another thing I want to press is that with relative clauses, as we've been discussing, you have choices. Maybe not so many with your speaking, but certainly with your writing. What I want to encourage you to do is I want you to look through your work once you've finished writing it and try to demonstrate a complete knowledge of relative clauses. If, you're, uh, if you've written a piece of formal writing and you've forgotten to include uh, some front loading, go back through it, put a line through some things, uh, make a little addition, impress the examiner. If, you've, uh, um, if you're doing a less formal piece of writing, something slightly more informal, well then go back and change uh, who's and which's for, for that's if you can, uh, or when, where and why. The point being is this, the examiner will see it, notice it, and love you for it. That's really what makes them happy, okay? So with, uh, with that all underneath our belts and uh, with the first three lessons watched, that just leaves me to say thank you very much for watching. Um, at the end of the study guide, there's a, there's some, uh, there's a very useful exercise uh, where you can practice all of, this, uh, all of these relative clauses. Um, if you don't have a study guide, uh, and I, you know, I've been mentioning them enough, you, you really need to get hold of a study guide um, at the beginning of each lesson. But if you don't have one, please go over to the website, logicalenglish.com. And, um, and while you're there, 
if you can, uh, you know, we've got the website, we've got the, the various things to, to maintain for, for the website. If you can give a donation, perhaps of uh, what, a dollar per lesson, something like that, it would be extremely useful. Thank you very much. Um, uh, please stay with us for the next video, uh, which will be the last of what I would call the big four uh, grammar videos. And it's on the subject of adverbs and adverbials. It's, uh, it should be slightly shorter than the previous three. Um, and a little bit different in its way of thinking. So uh, anyway, I'll see you for lesson four.